Okay, so before we get started, there's a couple of things we've got to get out of the way here before we jump right in to the topic. This is a new web series that I'm creating, and it's going to be called Power Metal Point. And no, by putting Power Metal in the title, it's not all about Power Metal. Each episode, we're going to look at a bunch of different things related to metal, everything from the history to production to all the sex, drugs, rock and roll, and the creation of your favorite riffs. I've been a metal fan for the majority of my life, and I figure at the very least, this show is going to do the reading for you as to today few of us actually like to read if we can help it. Okay, so let's dive right into this here. So power metal, what is it? Well, you can't very well begin to understand what the hell it is I'm talking about with the genre without hearing it. So here are a few clips of bands illustrating what power metal is all about. So as you can hear, power metal is often fast with double bass, soaring vocals, neoclassical guitar solos, and keyboards often sound more like guitar solos than what you would hear coming out of a MIDI file. Power metal sound is derived from what was once simply known as heavy metal. You know all the bands, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, Rainbow, Dio, and what would eventually turn into power metal took these early stylings of the genre and would push it to greater extremes. By the early to mid-1980s, bands were beginning to push the boundaries of metal even further. Metallica and their contemporaries like Slayer took the stylings of punk and heavy metal and turned it into speed metal and later thrash. Other bands like Queensryche and Judas Priest took soaring vocals to a whole other level thanks in part to the influence of singers like Ian Gillen of Deep Purple. Keyboards would also become a mainstay of the genre, and they originated in the acid and prog rock sounds of the late 1960s and into the 1970s. Soon we had bands like Halloween and Riot, each of which created essential power metal albums, Keeper of the Seven Keys and Thundersteel respectively, their sound leading the pack and would grow into what would become known as power metal. By the late 1980s, metal was growing into too many genres to remain calling every band under the sun heavy metal, because Black Sabbath no longer seemed to have very much in common with death other than distorted power chords. One of the biggest factors which separates death metal and power metal, two very similar musical genres in many respects, into different genres are a band's vocals. Death metal is based on growling, influenced by hardcore punk, and was later adopted by singers like Chuck Sheldoner of Death. Many singers, even if not explicitly classically trained like Jeff Tate or Yoakam Cans of Hammerfall, emulate an operatic style. Another major difference between power metal and most other genres is subject matter and choice of clothing. A favorite subject matter of many power metal bands is fantasy. Go pick up a Rhapsody of Fire album and you'll get exactly what I mean. Just have a look at some of these titles. Power of the Dragon Flame. Symphony of Enchanted Lands. These titles seem to have a lot more in common with Game of Thrones than they do anything about mastering the puppets and reigning in blood. Unlike the jeans and t-shirt mentality of early thrash bands trying to bring about a more working man sensibility to metal, power metal revels in the chains, loincloths, black leather, whips, swords, and gigantic statues of pyramids and just about everything else medieval. In many ways, power metal dresses the way the guy who owns your local comic book store wishes he could, or sometimes does. I guess it would be safe to say that although metal itself is a geek genre, perhaps the geekiest is power metal. 
and I certainly wouldn't doubt that this explains why I see so many videos of World of Warcraft being played on YouTube to the music of Hammerfall or Dream Evil. Despite being an underground genre and a niche genre, in many places such as Finland, power metal is still popular enough for bands to chart in the top 10, such as Nightwish and Stradivarius. In other places like North America, power metal bands mostly have to stick to playing smaller venues or high-profile festivals like Prog Power. As a Canadian myself, it can be difficult to see a lot of these bands live unless you live in a major city with a great promoter and just enough of a metal following within your city boundaries. Now before I wrap this episode, there's one more elephant in the room that I have to address. If you're wondering why this show's format is similar to gaming shows such as Zero Punctuation and Game Over Thinker, that's because first and foremost I'm a fan of these shows, but also it's because using a PowerPoint style enables me to make these shows quickly and get my message across as easily as possible. So hope today you've learned a lot about power metal and that you're inclined to go check out some of this music because a lot of it is fantastic, even if the lyrics maybe not quite so much. But there's a lot of musical genius to be found within this music, especially for musicians. So I want to thank you again for checking out the videos, and there will be more to come in the coming weeks. And until that time, keep it metal. <laughs>